What's going on, everybody? Welcome to the Dig It Podcast. I'm your host, Drew Walsh. And today we got special guests in the house. Some of you guys may know him as TN Defense from, you know, from years ago. And that's uh, some of you may know him as Trevor Knight. But um, Trevor Knight has been someone I've I've followed for a while. OK, like when I started really hammering into this infield performance stuff, I'm checking out, scrolling around. I see this TN Defense. I go in there, I check it out. I'm like, Damn. This is a sick page, right? So Tre- Tre- uh, Trevor was one of those coaches from – he's like kind of one of the OGs who were just putting out amazing content on a regular basis that I was like, okay, this is a guy I got to follow. He's doing tremendous things. He's uh, – what part of Canada, Coach, are you from? Uh, just south of Toronto, Kitchener, Ontario. Just, Kits- All right, Ontario. So, hey, yeah. without further ado, we're going to – we got so many cool things to dive in. Your journey has been really special, and it's been fun to watch it. Coach Trevor Knight, welcome to the Dig It Podcast. Thank you, man. This is awesome. And, dude, I remember, I remember the first time we ever spoke, and, yeah, I was putting up my stuff, but then – you started to put your stuff. I'm like, I better start putting my stuff away. This, you got, you, man, you are <laughs> something else. I'm like no. inspired by your stuff every day, man. It's It's been it's been phenomenal to watch your journey as well. So this has been, I'm excited to be here. No, I appreciate that, coach. And let, let's just start where we met, kind of like where you were, probably sometime during the COVID uh, pandemic. But I remember you had a really, really, really cool facility going on that I, I looked at that and I was like, this is my dream. Like this guy has yeah. an indoor facility where he does infield play. Like yeah. I need to do this. So take us like that had to be a wild ride. Give us a little insight on be, how, why, yeah. how'd you get there and then where you yeah. at. Yeah, no doubt. So, I mean, I never, my baseball path has been very non-traditional by any sense like I just I I haven't done the the usual route to get to professional baseball and I, I think um you know it's it's a fun story to tell because it's something that I still look back at and 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 go holy cow I don't know how I did that but um you know I was I was playing I went to a juco out of high school and played down there I, I was over I was all right like it was I think I got humbled you know I, I got to see what the American scene was about and <laughs> see how good these you guys really are um but it was something that opened my eyes and I and we we worked out of an indoor facility and I got inspired by that I was like I gotta do this man like this this is what's needed back in my hometown I'm a 17 year old freshman at the time right but love that so I get back I I I end up going there only for a year I get back uh, to Canada I go to a Canadian university um I played there as well and it was great baseball I loved it It was honestly some of the most fun years of my life I, I played there for three years it was very competitive it wasn't as good as the U.S. but I mean shit I, I learned so much um it, it it was phenomenal. It was in those three years where I decided, you know, I don't, the academic side of things wasn't for me. And so I, I decided to drop out um, after three years and just off a whim, just start a facility. Now it wasn't as easy as um, just starting a facility. I had to find an investor and get the money raised and do all these different things. But um, by 20, by 21 years old, uh, we had a $2 million, 30,000 square foot indoor facility built. And I was running it as a person that's that's never run a business before in my <laughs> life, and I, so I luckily my business partner who who fronted all the money and believed in me and trusted me, you know, gave me all the expertise and everything that I needed to get going, and then just guided me along the way. But the you know ultimately it was a it was a goal to get a place where in in Canada in the winter you can go and get you know it's a it, there was a full infield with 30 foot high ceilings like you can go in there and get like a full fungo routine done like you're not just taking little cage fungos it's um it was the real deal and so for me that was like i gotta stop you there right that i mean that's a lot like you just walked off the stage and said thank you got your cap and gown whatever did your thing and then and then just started a a what that's insane to me i think that's so inspiring like there's so many kids younger kids that we train like just get done with college i have no idea what they want to do and they just got done playing and that's been their identity their entire life and and yeah. they may want to pursue coaching that's really cool to just see you you know take a chance right and obviously you had some support Why by not? someone to help you but you know what are some things that's you obviously had some some hurdles and obstacles within that opening phase or just starting yeah. to run a business phase for what, sure. How how had the community receive you when you opened up? Well, we were the first one of our kind in that area. Um, and so it was it got a ton of publicity. But getting to that point to get the money actually raised, um, 
I, I, like I said, I, and I, I got out of there, uh, my third year of school and I started drawing up a business plan. I had no idea what to do with a business plan. Right. So I was trying to wing it as I had this image of like, I want to build a big building and make sure we're able to do everything that we need to do inside. Um, and I, I knew what I wanted to wanted it to look like, but I had no idea how to do market research and how much we were going to need to pay off the building every month. And all I never knew how to do that. And so the first sure. time I actually took it, took it to the investor, the guy was like, no, we got this. Is, <laughs> this ain't going to make money. Like, there's no uh, way. Go let back me know when you wake up. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Go back to the drawing board. Right. And so I did. I went back and I, I, I kept going. And through that process, man, I learned tons. I learned so much about myself and then about, about what the market actually needs. And then that's where the place was built. And then once it got open, I had to fill it. I had to, I had to make the money. Like it was like, yes. yeah, this is this beautiful cathedral of indoor baseball training, but now what do we do? And so it's, it's there was expensive. A lot of, yeah. There, it was, it was, it was like 30 grand a month, just in, just in our rent alone. It was just, and then we had staff wow. on top. It was crazy. It was way, way. Oh, I was way, wow. in, way over my head. Dude, it was <laughs> stupid. But it was stupid, but uh, um, we, we got it going, man. And I, and I had no idea. I had, it was at first, I'm like, look, we're going to fund this place solely on individual lessons alone. And I was only one guy. I, you can only do so many lessons. And I didn't, I didn't think of bringing multiple people in at once to maybe make it a little bit more worth my time and their time. It was just, it took a lot of, a lot of trial and error. And, and I made a ton of mistakes and we didn't make money right away at all. So, um, but I wouldn't trade it for the world, man. I, it taught, like I said, it taught me everything. That was my, my real education was running that business. I don't think there's a better education, right? I think, you know, it's good to learn some foundational pieces, but I think you just got to go get in the trenches. And I, I can't, to this day, that's the stickiest learning ever, right? Being in the tr trenches and Absolutely. trying things out and letting the market decide whether or not that's going to work. If the market doesn't like it, it doesn't matter how much you like it. Like, it's probably you need to adjust something, right? So that's very non-traditional, coach. <laughs> Usually- yeah, you build the business and then it's like, all right, like, Hey, I'm, I'm at capacity. Like I need to hire coach drew to come in and train some yeah. people. I need to hire coach, whatever, and then bring in and build that business and continue to, to an outreach. But it was like, nah, I'm going to build it. They're going to come. So more power to you. That, that That's Appreciate just such that. a amazing story. Um, obviously, you know, over COVID you so congratulations sold the business is it still functioning as a indoor facility or what no so what happened was yeah it was it was post covid it was 2021 uh we actually ran it through covid um i got the job with the angels in 2019 um we'll get to that i guess but um so we ran it i ran it from a afar a we had someone at the facility obviously every day and i was just kind of helping from afar when i could but once covid hit we actually did everything Canada was strict about their their restrictions and so we did everything isolated and and or online so we would do stuff in the facility as instructors and zoom it out and it was we try to run it all the way through and then but yeah come 2021 it was it was becoming a little bit too much to balance the two and I didn't want play ball to suffer the, the facility I didn't want it to suffer because I wasn't putting enough attention into it and I didn't want my career with the angels to get you know I didn't want to be torn away from that either. And so I was, I was really torn and it was an extremely tough decision, but yeah, we ended up selling it and um, it, it actually turned into a, a basketball facility. Um, the guy that okay. bought it actually, actually flipped the entire infield, put courts in there. And it's, it's an, it's a beautiful place now, but since play ball went, since we opened the first facility there, the region um, that it's in has multiple facilities um, have, that have popped up since, which is amazing. So we started yes. like a, like uh, the, they, the people saw the need for an indoor facility for baseball. And so it's still, there's still many places to go to in the area and they're all great. And so um, I'm happy that I was able to get the foot in the door for everybody to see what, you know, you could, you could do. And, um, and now they have it there and in, uh, in, in the other places and it's perfect. So yeah, it's, it's all, it's all been good, man. It's, it was, it was a clean transition for sure. Coach, that's amazing. So it just sounds like you're the pioneer. You saw, like you mentioned, the void in the industry and you started it. And it's really cool to see the impact or hear the impact that it's had on on that region. And it's just better for the game. Even if it's if it's basketball, you're still helping out youth athletes. But no to your point about how like tough a decision that was, like that was your baby. Like you put in what? so thousands of hours to try and make that thing stay open. And once you did and saw the you know, saw the light at the end of the tunnel and we're working, we're grooving and you get this amazing opportunity. A lot of people don't like getting outside their comfort zone. And you're obviously not that dude. 
Um, mm-hmm. So you get you get a call, you get an opportunity to go coach at the highest level in the world, right? LA Angels come out, they call you, want to bring you in, and you have this, you grew this baby that you don't want to abandon, but you yeah. don't want to shut down an opportunity in front of you. So let's just start there. Like you've been in with the the Angels now for three years, or f- no, since 2019. So got the goal, got the call oh. in 2019. Yeah. So, so since then, season, yeah. man, I, I guess. If you could, let's get a little bit of a summary of 2019 to present day. There's so much, but just hit me with some uh, bullet points. Sure. Yeah. So the um, it was that process in in itself was wild. I didn't ever expect to have this job. Like you said, that was my baby, and I built that, and I I expected to be in that for forever, and just continue to build myself in that you know industry um, in that capacity. Um, in the Canada scene, which you would have killed, was, which you would have dominated, and you, you you still always can. That's the cool part. Yeah, yeah, I would love to go back and do it eventually, and I and there's plans to do that. Um, but you know, like you mentioned, right when we started this, I had TN defense running, Trevor and I defense, right? At the Instagram, the social media, it's, it's, it's it's incredible what it's, it's incredible what social media can do. The fact that we're talking like six years later, it's it's awesome. Like it's an amazing 100%. platform. It can be so negative, but it can also be such an amazing place, you know. Hundred percent. I I'm the first to be like social media can be super annoying, but I'm also the one that is most thankful for it because it actually led to what I'm doing now. And um, you know, I, I started TN Defense just a ho- as a hobby. Started putting my stuff out out there, and it was man. I go back and look at my stuff now and how wordy I was and <laughs> so many things I would change. And it's not that I was like necessarily wrong, but dude, I've learned so much since then. But the fact that the angel saw something via Instagram enough to just like give me a call and say, Hey, we're interested in just chatting with you at that point was wild to me. And I remember taking the phone call um, that ended up being like my job interview. And I had no idea. And I was just wow. pacing around the pacing around the infield at, at play ball, just answering their questions. And it was all to do like technical stuff. And th- if you had this situation, what would you do? And man, I remember being just after, after hanging up the phone and just being like, that was the coolest thing ever. I don't even know what it was for, but <laughs> I blacked um, out. <laughs> I did. I did. It was, but it was amazing. And then, you know, a couple months later, they called me and said, Hey, we'd like to give you a job. And, um, but yeah, since then it's been incredible. So I, I, uh, had to figure out a, I got to run the facility. Once that was done, I, I got to tell them, yeah, I'm, I'm in, let's do this. And, uh, 2019, I was in low a with, uh, they don't have a team now, but Burlington, Iowa, it was in the Midwest league. The Midwest league is still a thing, but it's now high. A. It's a whole thing. They, they, they shifted everything around after COVID. But so I got to, I got to get in, in my foot in the door as a defensive coach. Um, and basically, I went to low A and I sir, I just worked with the infielders. That was my job. Um, I think they kind of just tried to like slowly get me introduced. You know, I'd throw batting practice and I would hit all the fungos and I would do the IO and do all those kinds of things. And I was just very limited in my focus while also like observing what else, everything else that was going on. Um, but come that fall, I realized very quickly that you're not going to make it in this industry if you don't start to get a little bit more of an understanding about everybody else. And I mean, I'm talking pitching, catching, it doesn't matter what it is. You need to understand the roles of everybody so that you can make you better. And so, you know, throughout this process, I've learned a ton and and I'm now at a point where um, I'm doing a, a whole bunch of different things uh, for the org and infield is still by far my passion, like I mentioned before, but um, I'm starting to get my, my eyes open to what else is out there in, in the, in this game. And, um, so yeah, no, I started in low A and now I'm going to be going into my second season in high A, but, but I'm going to be doing the bench coach role um, up there in the Pacific Northwest. Um, and I'm coach, I'm, what are those responsibilities as a, you know, when someone hears a bench coach, like you mean just sit on the yeah. bench and chew bubble gum, spit seeds. What do you got? What do you talk guys out of slumps? Yeah. What are you doing? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, yeah, there's some bubble gum involved, I'm sure. But, uh, <laughs> Hopefully big, no, big uh, chew. Yeah, <laughs> big league chew. Yeah. No, uh, a lot of it is, um, I'll still do all the infield stuff, um, but now it's more like I'll, I'll, I'm, I'll be coaching a base, whether it's third or first. Um, I mean, I've been doing that for the last five years anyways, but that's that's definitely part of the role. Um, I'll be coaching a base and then um, I'll do the base running stuff at the affiliate. I'll do all the infield, all the outfield stuff. I'll do a lot of the scheduling for the skipper. Um, you know, if the skipper gets tossed, I'll, I'll step into that role. Um it's it's a, you really wear many hats. You, you you coordinate travel. You help with travel. It's it's a lot of it's a lot of computer work 
Um, it's a lot of scheduling work. It's a lot of behind the scenes stuff, um, not just in game or, you know, in practice stuff. And so it's an all encompassing thing. And it's, truthfully, man, it feels like I'm running a business again. And I, I love it. It's very, very yeah. like entrepreneurial, you know, like you, you need to stay prepared. You need to be organized. Um, it's not just making dudes better on the, like defensively, like it's everything now. And you're, you're getting to talk, you know, situations you're getting to go. It, there's so many different things that you can, you can do in this role. And it's just kind of like an all encompassing thing. And that is what's so appealing to, uh, you know, this role for me. And I, I love it. It's allowing me to really like branch out as a, as a coach and as a, as a person, really, man, it's just giving me a ton of confidence. And so I'm thrilled to be in the spot that I'm in. That's amazing. And you put, you deserved every, every bit of it. You put yourself Thank in you. that line to, to possibly, you know, get a managerial role. So you deserve all that. It, it was Thank all you. earned, right? It's not, I just want, I always make the point, man, people will use excuses like that person's lucky, knew this person, that person. It's like, yeah, maybe, but you still had to work. Um, sure. What I, what I hear there is cool. is like you came in micro, you vision, baseball, like you came in micro infield play. That's what I do. Today yeah. you stand like as a macro, like I see everything outside the stadium, yeah. inside the stadium, on the field, yeah. above the field, um, at the whole, you know, so it's really cool. And it takes me back to my college coaching days. You know, I, I, I had the awesome opportunity to continue after I got done playing the coach college. And what it really did with, for me was open up my eyes at how little it is actually on the field X's and O's, right? Like you think no college coaching is just like, like bubble gum, fungos, indies, game, eat, next do it all over again but like yeah, that was yeah. farthest from the truth like yeah. i was sitting there going over transcripts i'm I'm driving all over freaking northeast to go recruit yeah, um, yeah. It, it was just so much office stuff i'm like yo i didn't sign up for this i, I need to be on the field um <laughs> but that 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 reminded me of that and that that's amazing coach before i forget have you ever had to step into the head coaching did skip get tossed and you're like all right I, yeah I guess, yeah thoughts, it's the best thoughts man. Dude, it's the coolest. It's, it, the first time it happened, you're, I looked at my hitting coach, who I've been with for the last three years. I looked at him and I'm like, who's getting the card? You know, like, we don't know. So someone has to go out and get it. He's going to come back in the dugout. Someone's going to have to take the lineup card from him and then take over. And so that first time was a little awkward. But, um, you know, since then, <laughs> Skipper goes out, you're like, you start you start getting limber, you know. Are you, fighting, are you fighting hitting coach? Like, yo, that's me, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh and then he comes back down and he gives you that 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 lineup card he gets up in the tunnel and you, it's it's you man and you get to go out there and do your thing and it, i love it i personally love it the first few times it was a little nerve-wracking i had no idea what i was doing you know sure. it's just a whole lot you, you're seeing a whole lot of, of every you have to look at everything right and so it opened my eye it was eye-opening you know handling pitch the bullpen and talk like it's just a, it, it's a lot to to talk about and a lot to handle but but now when it happens, man, it's it's great. I love it. Like you get tossed more often, man. It's great. But, but oh, um, it's 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 uh it's it's such a challenge too. Like at this level, because you're dealing with you're dealing with like not they're not major leaguers yet. Like in high, you know, they're still they're still like younger. It's 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 still it's still such a cool level because they're they're also learning so much about it, and so we're we're all kind of in the dugout learning together. And so when that, when that scenario pops up, it's, it's awesome how they can kind of, you know, get my vibe of like, I'm locked in, but I'm a little nervous. Like there's some nerves there. And so it's like, we all, it's just a cool thing that happens, man. It's, it's part of the, it's, it's something that I'm, I'm happy that I get to do every once in a while. And, and in minor league baseball, not every org does it, but most orgs do it where everybody on staff gets a, a four day break. And so they, they go away. And so the bench coach then takes over for those four days. And so that's a good, that's a good time to get your feet really wet and like sit down, come into the lineup every day. And like, you're the, you're the skipper for those four days. There's, it's not just like mid game change, you know, it's, it's the whole thing. And so that's pretty cool. It's, I'm glad that the angels let us do that. Um, that's a pretty cool feeling. So. You got uh, goosebumps hearing about that. It's just so cool. Cause a lot of things there coach, it's like, you could look at it from the vantage point of first time doing something that you've been thinking about and it, it happens and it's like, you know, should I get off the pot, right? Like you just got to yep. do it. Even though you're nervous, yep. you know what you're doing, but you haven't been in the situation, but you're like, I got to do it. All right. And, yep. and you could always reflect. You do your best job in the moment. You reflect totally. and like, all right, like pretty good job there. Might have, might do that differently next time when I get the opportunity, yep. but like that's the amazing process. And that that's a, that, that could translate to any, 
any industry, just there's opportunities. Oh, yeah. They're uncomfortable. Say yes, try it out, reflect. And then you'll be like, yo, I'm alive. That wasn't that bad. Exactly. So I love from that standpoint, I think it's amazing. And then to hear, you know, you're a human, right? Like you're going to, you're going to have excitement. You're going to have frustration, maybe some fear. And to just let people know that you're real, like, yo, I'm human. I'm doing this, doing my best job. And for them to see like, yo, Coach Snipes, man, he's the man, right? He's doing, he's killing it out there. We got yeah. him. Though. Like he's human, yeah. just like us. It's the best, I think man. it builds trust, vulnerability. Like I love that stuff. Totally. Um, totally. Let's let, let's get a little bit more micro within like, I'm sure when you stepped on, like you mentioned, day one with the angels like you did some things you might not have loved or verbalized things in a way that you might not verbalize them now specific Mm -hmm. maybe the infield play you know what are some things like i look back you know six months i'm like damn like i or 12 Mm -hmm. months and and it's not principle wise like my philosophy and principles the same but the way i implement things because i'm getting reps every day a lot of reps every day and i'm learning i'm watching them move i'm communicating with them and they're giving me feedback to let me know if what i'm saying is is working and obviously mm-hmm. if you could see it if it's working or not but i want to yeah. hear from your vantage point like you know five years ago you got on you knew everything what do you got mm-hmm. uh what are some things now you're like don't think that's that pertinent anymore or i should have coached yeah. that more back then you know what's crazy is like it's it's funny when you're in a facility setting or like um you know high school setting some you're dealing with younger guys um you know, those younger high school years where there's a lot of, there's a lot of holes, right? There, there's a lot of moving parts that they're not controlling yet. And so it's a, it's, it's a lot easier. I I would say, I don't want to say easy is maybe not the right word, but it's, it's better for us as coaches with those younger guys to be able to be like, Hey man, let's break this, let's break this down. Like, yes, it starts with your feet and then we work up from there or or however your, whatever your style might be, but there's a lot of things that you can really break down with these guys. And then when you get to the professional level, this is the, the biggest thing that happened for me, like almost immediately, like day one, dealing with the prospect and early work. And A, you have an organization to represent, right? So you, they have a philosophy that you need to make sure that you're trying to stay within. I wasn't really sure of it at that point. So, sure. so you're getting out there, and you're like, what can I do? What can I not do with this guy? And then at the same time, they're pretty good. And so what all the stuff that you've done with these these younger guys, you know, whether it's little things like on their knees, just doing isolation work, they don't necessarily need that. Or maybe they do like, maybe they do. It was just, it was something that made me realize right away that every professional athlete is different and they all need different things. And I needed to quickly figure out what um, those things were. And if they're, I also needed to understand that sometimes you can, you don't, you don't need to coach. You don't need to say something. Like sometimes it's just about getting in their reps, you know what I mean? And like, it's, that was good. That was it. They, they look for feedback and you just say, that looked good. You don't always need to give them something to go with, you know? And so I had to learn that quickly because I found myself like trying to just coach, just to coach. And no one ever told me like, Hey man, slow down with the, with the, with the coaching. Like you don't need to nitpick every little thing they do. No one ever told me that, but I kind of caught myself a bunch of times being like, what, what am I doing? You know? And so I had to like, like tone it down, like rein it in. And I'm still working on that. Like, truthfully, I, I really am. There's times where I'll get, I'll get sped up with guys and be like, we got to work on this. And, I, and I, I'm shifting focus from hands to feet, to eyes, to, to timing, to whatever it might be all in the same session. And I know as someone's doing that to me, trying to teach me that way, I ain't getting it. So I need to like, it's very important that you learn to like compartmentalize, man. It's like one thing today, focus on that one thing and kill it. And if it's, if it's, if it's literally like if you're feeling out that guy and it's early work, maybe he's grinding a little bit it's later in August, like, and he just needs a couple of fungos. He needs four minutes of work. Like go do it. That's it. And then walk and then leave it. Like, you know what I mean? So it, it was, a, it wasn't so much that I didn't agree with what I was teaching prior. I think I had a bunch of knowledge to bring to these guys and I still do, but it was about not bombarding anybody with information. That was the biggest thing for me. It was not, not just laying it all on at once because it takes time. Everything's a process. And so you've got to break things down over time. Um, so that was, that so was, good. that was it for me. Yeah. Two thing, major things, concepts there I hear is less is more and keep the goal of the goal, right? Yep. If you got individual a, and you know, their goal is first step, just work on first step, man. If you, or whatever it may be, whatever task it is, 
I think that's such a such an important message there. And and I I feel it every day, coach. Like sometimes I'm just like nonstop. And and part of it's just like energy while like I'm keeping energy up, keeping kids engaged because sure. I work in the, the private sector with younger kids. Yes. Yeah. Sometimes I'm just like, I heard the in one, two sentences how much information I just gave this this 12 year old. I'm like, right. I'm exhausted. Like I'm trying, <laughs> I'm trying to get this kid to feel what I see. But I just gave him three like dense, dense, dense sentences. I'm like, that's my fault. And I'll take blame a lot on some stuff. Like, hey, that's on me. That's on me. Take a yeah. deep breath. Clear that slate. Come here real quick. We're only working on this. <laughs> you know, because yeah, my, my mind, you know what I mean? Like my mind wants to do a million things because I care so much. I love coaching. Yeah, exactly. But the best coaches in the world are simple genius. They could say things that are so complex in one word. And you're like, that's all, that's all I had to say. Like, you know, so I had coach Lee Taft on the podcast. He was on episode three. Yeah. 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 He's arguably the best speed coach in the world. And yeah. coach Lee Taft, if a parent would have listened to him be like, I don't like, is, is he that smart? Like it. And anyone who's been in the industry, like the highest of the highest people be like, that dude is a genius. Cause he can talk, <laughs> he can talk about yeah. the most complex things and just have yeah. a conversation over coffee. And you're just like, yo, so coach, that's such that's such a great message, and it's it's it makes sense too when you think about like the the development, the skill progression. Like the goal in infield play, if that's what we're talking about right now, the goal mm -hmm. is to catch the ball and collect an out. That's the goal. It, a you ball's go. hit, you catch it, you throw it. That's that's it. Now, like you can look at spectrum. Like the we don't. I look at drills to build skills. But the better athlete I have, the better infielder I have, the less drills I need. Because the yep. goal is for him to catch the ball as efficiently as possible as throw it to first base. So I just yep. want to do that over yep. and over and over. And so what it sounds like, and this, I could look at it from like, I, I, like I train athletes in the gym and on the field. Training athletes early on, I am the smartest. It's the easiest job in the world because neuromuscular yep. adaptation. I give them no weight and just teach patterns and they get so much back from it. They think I'm God, but I'm yeah. like, nah, man, it's just your body too much. You're going to be like, you don't know anything, but then the infield play wise, like younger kids need, like, it's almost like bumper rails when you're like, when you're bowling, sure. like they need context first and then they need some guiding. And then they just ultimately need to go play fast and just learn yep. from the game. Yeah. What do you got on that? I, I, <laughs> this is it's funny you say that like so the way i first of all i mean i've said this to you for the longest time the way you break down the body and 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 piece it together and show the 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 movement of things of how it should all transition into itself unbelievable and the drill work that you do to do to like to show those things um it's on i don't i, I truthfully think it's unmatched i don't think anybody else does it as good I as paid him to say and that. Check Venmo. I, I, no, no, you didn't. I swear, I swear to you. I, I look at your stuff all the time. I learn from it to this that. day. And um, I honestly, truthfully get a little bit fired up at the professional level. Sometimes when you get a guy that maybe doesn't move as well, or like you can see something in his movement patterns that's like clearly slowing him down. And it's like, it's not, a, it's not a tough fix. I get amped up because I'm like, holy shit. I get to like, I get to break my stuff down again. Like, let's do this. <laughs> yes, Where yes, most yes, of the guys... Yes most of the guys at that level are already moving well and they already understand, you know, how to utilize their bodies and what, what needs to happen, you know, in sequence. Right. And so they get that when I get the chance to actually talk about it, it's, it's super exciting for me, but at our, our level um, it's more like talking about pace and understanding the hitter and all the extra, extra stuff that happens um, to, to, you know, slow the game down and, um, be under control and be a good infielder at this level. So um, I think I'm, I'm going away from your question a little bit, but. Um, no, there was no questioning because I went on a rant. So I wanted to tap you in real quick because I knew you had stuff to say. So no question. Keep we, we're good. No, but I, I just think for me, it's like, it, it's different at this, at this level. It's, it's not so much, you know, we're not working so much with the sequence of things. It's more, uh, you know, in some cases, yes, but a lot of it has to do now with, um, understand positioning, you know, how do I play this guy? What's how much, how, how fast does this guy get down the line? Um, you need to know the speed of the runner. How, how, like, what's this guy do? What does he roll over on a lot of balls? Is he, is he should, we, should we shade a middle? Um, like there's a whole bunch of stuff now that we talk about that 
then you can start to give them context in their drill, their drill work. It's not so much fancy footwork drills that we need to do every day. It's like hitting fungos with context, you know, and like that's the kind of stuff that's that we do up here that I had to learn as well. Um, I didn't because I never did any of that stuff ever. I never even thought of that kind of stuff. And so I had to learn that as a coach up here um, to start to add context and put these guys in situations that will make them comfortable going into a game, you know, game setting. Um, and so a lot of early work is, is that, um, now we have a new skipper, um, with the angels who obviously lives and dies by, um, the, 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 the Ron Washington hands routine that everybody sees on the internet like crazy. Right. And does, does things, does variables or does very variants of it on their own. Um, and so he's, he, he's amazing. He, we got to, I got to listen to him for four days straight, talk about it and like, um, really explain what what's important about it and all it comes down to is the consistency of the routine and so that's another thing that I, I i needed to to learn as well because in the private sector i was always trying to make things different like i was always trying to like keep them coming back keep them engaged keep them excited sure. right professional baseball you're getting paid so like your this is your job to come in be consistent every single day and so he he's like this is what we do every day every day every day and like by that it truthfully like consistency breeds habits right good habits and so um that's something that i'm like all on board for i love it i i was so i was ready to run through a wall for the guy um, <laughs> after listening to him because i think it's something that's going to help our guys um through every level so drastically because it's going to it's going to create good habits and um ultimately you know you're going to have that basis every single day that that base to know that hey i'm going to do the, this routine and then anything extra I can do as well, it's fine. But I, I always have that base. Like I did my work, like I did my, my, my main thing. And then I can branch from that every day if I have to. Um, so I, I, I don't know, again, I'm rambling again, but. I no, just... no. That's why you're on this freaking podcast, the ramble. <laughs> what I would ramble on is I love that. Just like, you got to have a center. Like you got to yeah. have a balance somewhere. You can, there's so many places mentally you can go within this game. You know, especially even with, with defense, right? You could be in a rut, right? You could be not feeling right. But if you know you got yeah. these drill sets, this routine that's going to center you or recenter you, all right, yeah. I feel good now. Like, I, I know where I'm at. I know where my hands are. Like, it's my eyes are connected. Okay, let's go get some GBs. Maybe it's at a slower pace today just so I could find some rhythm. And yeah. that's what I kind of wanted to talk to you about is two things. We're coming back to Wash because he's the GOAT. Second, yeah. Yo, break down pace for me, man. And because we're, we're, this is something I'm big on and I, I work a lot with my kids, giving them their pace. Dude, it's so cool that you asked that. So I, I, I was looking through your Instagram here right before we got on the call. Let me, I want to read it out. Hold on. Let me just go back to it here fast. It's going to say Trevor Nipes the best. No, 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 no. So it says <laughs> we, we build defensive architects that collect outs and shrink infields. And the last part of that. The shrink infields is the coolest thing. For like me. that? <laughs> oh, dude, it's awesome. And that, that, here's what I'm, you were talking about Tap and, and how he says like one thing and it sounds super genius. Shrink infields. Like I can't stress that enough. And that's one of the things, and we will talk about Wash, but that's one of the things that his routine really emphasizes. It puts emphasis on is like going to get the, go get the yes. thing. You know what I mean? Yes. Like go get it. Go, go, go control the thing and then make that throw easier. And, and a lot of people, and you see it's so, so common and it's upsetting that you watch a ton of video of amateur athletes and showcase settings or um you know taking ground balls you know pre-game whatever it might be and there's just like limited movement and yeah it might look sexy it might look smooth but there's just limited limited action it's you know? not and gonna it play it's not realistic doesn't play like stop trying to look so good just go catch it Go take that thing away and throw the thing. That, that's it. Like it doesn't have to. Talking about Every, it. everybody's going to look different. Man. <laughs> everybody's going to be different. Everybody plays this game differently. But the smoothest and the sexiest thing to me is making an out. Like go get the thing and throw the guy out. And so we talk about pace all the time. I talk about pace all the time. And like, what's the average down down? You know, first baseline. You know, four two. We're looking at four two major league level four two. <laughs> if you hold a stopwatch and you click you know, click and you try and wait to four or two, like, and you think about all the time that happens in that four two, I don't want to be flat footed or stopped at all during that time. I don't want to rush. I don't need to rush. I have time, but during that time, my feet have to be moving. My, my body has to be moving in a positive direction, going in a direction of where the baseball is and then making a neat, uh, making 
you know, throw easier for myself because of what my feet did during that time. If I don't, if I, if I take two steps and let the ball get on me and I'm trying to like tap and get my rhythm and make a throw. Sure. Some guys might do it. You might get out. Like it's fine, but you're not going to be as consistent, consistent as you think over a 162 game schedule. Like it just isn't. I'm talking at the major league level, but for me, it's like, dude, you have 4.2 seconds. That's an eternity. That really is an eternity. So like be active in those, in those seconds, like be, be active, be under control, but be active, go get the ball, shrink the infield. I love that and throw it and make an easier throw. And the other thing too, that people don't think about for me is like being positive movement to a ball doesn't necessarily always mean right at it or like on an angle or cutting an angle off. Dude, a positive movement might be a drop step back. And like you, you but if you, and if you can control that movement going on that back angle, you're only going to set yourself up to make a good throw. Like that's the thing that people don't understand either is like you're not always going to be able to go in on the ground ball. That's just the thing. And you might make a bad read and have to adjust. And so how do we control our body to get our footwork with us to actually then make a good throw? Everything, everything is trying to build up to a, a good, accurate throw. Right. And so understanding the amount of time that we have and allow, and then allowing your body to work within that time. That's the, that's the, that's the message, man. Like let's work efficiently with our body actively um, in, in this amount of time, make a good throw, shrink the infield. I love that. I love that term. Love my man. I appreciate you. And I'm just like, we could stop this podcast now if we want to. <laughs> um, but that's just so, so, so much goal there. And part of the shrink the infield is also a, a mindset. Like we coach our guys play offense on defense and it's just more so just like, go be expressive, go be a creative, go make mistakes. Don't make the same ones over and over now, but shrinking yeah. the shrinking infield for us is like, our ability to to literally shrink the infield. There's not an angle or lane off my hip that I can't go attack a ball. And the biggest thing is once you give them the skill of throwing athletically, these younger kids, right? Like older guys are more athletic and stronger, but the younger yep. kids, once they find their right foot and sling it across their body and they have success once, the, that next ground ball, when the game tells them they can, they go shrink an infield and get rid of it and have confidence and try new things. And it's a beautiful, beautiful art to watch. That's yes, part is. of it too. Um, I love the pace, man. We talk about internal clock a lot. Speed of runner time, speed of ball equals internal clock. And then yep. you need to have your own pace. Like Coach mentioned, it's probably going to be something like a four step or a two step that you know Coach Kai Correa or somebody has popularized, right? And there's stuff like that. Like no matter what, if runner is super poor runner or trips, I can't stop because he did because I'm going to yeah, disrupt the thrower. I need to have my bottom pace control that. And I'm not care. Like, I don't, I know what you're doing, but I'm not going to stop to you. I play at my pace and that's the bottom pace. I'm going to play as a four step and routine no ground balls. Um, I, uh, someone's goal with, with, with that, with that too, is like the other thing that I think gets missed is especially in the younger athlete, younger, younger level or lower level uh, pro guys as well is a lot of guys will feel ground balls and then look at the runner. Like, don't look at the runner. Pick up the pick up your first baseman. Just throw it over. Like if you know things ahead of time, like all right, this this dude is the first baseman that's hitting right now. He's just a big. He's a donkey. Like I, I have time. I know that ahead of time. Ball is hit to me. I don't need to see him running. Right. A lot of guys will feel the ground ball, take a quick peek, and all of a sudden that little quick peek of the runner is just gonna throw you out of sync. Just catch it. You know what's happening. It does. You don't need to watch him run. Catch it and throw the, throw the ball to first base. It's it's just simple as that pick up your first base so player. gold and those little things just like like you mentioned um i forget the statement you used oh okay listen the moment we feel the ball we instantly become a thrower so like mm -hmm. your feet dictate you can't forget about the thrower and and, and that's part of like you know when, when the little like we have eternity in 4.2 seconds or greater but there's little things that make that four seconds really fast. And then it could be looking yeah. at the runner. It could just be, like you know, and that ball entering in your glove, like, you know, help me out with his name, Coach Infield Chatter, and, uh, Tucker Frawley, you Tucker know, with Frawley, his yeah. new glove and stuff like that. Like where that ball arrives in your glove is so much influence on the thrower, right? Like where that yeah. you break your hands is the first sequence of your throw. Pay yeah. attention to that. Be good in that transition. Yeah. So there, there's so many things, I guess. What's one thing like what lead what do you think about? Like obviously you're working with some of the most talented infielders in the nation, but I've also worked with really high level 
uh, infielders, and there's still a decent amount. It's a different environment, but there's still a lot to work on. If you could bullet point some of those things you think they need to work on most commonly. Uh, perfecting the routine. Perfecting the routine play. Um, it, for me, it's like you. some of the best guys in the world, guys that we've seen, um, either with other orgs or in our org, is like they're going to go make that spectacular spectacular play, right? They might make a diving play and throw a guy out from their knees, or they might make a play deep in the, in, in the six hole um, with like a perfect one hop thrower in the air. Like it's those things that they're going to make those plays. And it's really exciting to see that. Um, but for a lot of it, especially the lower levels, it's about protect, it's, it's about perfecting what's routine and keeping it routine. Like you, do, you never want to be sit, sitting on the bench and, and gasp every time a, a, a routine six, three is hit, you know, like you want, you want to think automatic. And once you start to, once you start to see those guys, you know, make that become automatic, you're like, this guy's ready to go to the next level. Like that yes. is the difference. You know what I mean? And so everything is tailored towards perfecting the routine, like the routine pay, play, make the routine play. Um, of course, there's going to be little things like someone needs to work with, like presenting a little bit more to their backhand, like, or like the timing of, of, of when they arrive at the ball or after the catch, what do they do with their feet? Like, like there's going to be things that guys need to work on, but the main thing and the main emphasis, at least from my standpoint is just perf perfect, make the routine play. The spectacular will happen, but make the routine play because more times than not, it's good. That's what's going to be hit at you. A ball to your left or a ball to your right is like one step to your left, one step to your right, make that play, go get it. Um, and let the other stuff take care of itself. Go be an athlete at that point. You know what I mean? And so that would be my my simplest way to put it is just perfect the routine, make make the routine play. I love that, Coach, because I think there's something more met, like deeper than that. It's like, yo, we're making the routine play, but you're building momentum, you're building confidence, you're building awareness yeah. for every other play, right? You're getting reads, you're yeah. moving, you're finding rhythm with the ball through the ball, you're finding slots and throwing rhythms through the throw, and I think that all that stuff just layers out into the field. Yeah. Um, yep. lanes and stuff like that so I think there's gold in that and it's also your job like be good like in strength and conditioning we'll talk about like we need to dominate the squat like listen we might not train the squat forever because there's it depends on the athlete and you know there's a whole whole cascade of things why we would do split stand stuff but you start with the squat right like you, you dominate yep. that and then you move into single leg stuff similar to that in infield play I love that back to wash you know he he gets a lot of, he, he's a goat and a lot of people look at his hand stuff. And then some coaches will be like, you know, no, that's not what you do with your hands. Right. Like that's not what we're trying to do. But I think at a higher, higher level, there's a way bigger purpose than what he's doing. And and when coaches look at stuff like that, and this is a general thing, they see things, but they, like if a coach on the other end doesn't do a good job explaining why they're doing it, or they're not with them to know how they got there or where they're going there's a lot of gray area, right? There's a sub For sure. lot of, you know, context not developed. But when I see washes stuff, A, when we don't have our feet, what needs to increase loudness or increase intensity? Hands. So Hands, yeah. when, I, when, I, when I see that, and it's almost as like, I trained a kid with, on Texas who worked under Tulo. And he came back doing that. And my initial stuff was like, damn, don't, don't you think that's a little collisional? Like you're working the ball back to where it's coming. And ultimately, long story short, is what it really did for these infielders is protect their feet. They kept the ball away from their feet because they were so good at keeping the ball out in front, stopping it and redirecting it, okay. that it, I was like, oh, snap. That's what he meant by getting his hands loud through the ball versus something like that. So yeah. I think, does that make sense? Is, is that where he's going with it? Yeah, and, and I'm not going to be I, like, I'm not going to pretend to be like, best friends of wash shit. I, I just met him, but, and he was amazing. So I'm not going to, I'm not going to speak too much on, on, sure. on everything that he said, but um, the, the thing that I gather, and I guess the, the, this thing that I'm trying to still figure out with him and eventually I'm going to get to ask him again, which I can't wait, but is, you know, what I'm basically finding from him is it's more like exactly what you said. I, we're trying to create more of a, a like we're going to control it as opposed to letting it control us. And that's the simplest way to put it. Like, um that move that hand move through the ball, ball for me looking at it the first few times I'm like really eh? like that's, that's funky like, it is it is but that you then you do it you run through it and I got I got an opportunity to like run through it with like an actual like the fungo hit at me do the whole the whole process and you really only make that really aggressive move 
it only feels most aggressive when you're on your knees and you're really isolated. Once you start to like get on your feet and you start to like utilize your body, you, you realize the glove movement's really, really short. And then you think about more like once you start to really take full, like full speed ground balls, you realize this, this funnel term is not, it's it's just not it's just not a thing for me like it, I, i'm at a point now where i'm like that's not a move that we need to be making if our feet are you absolutely our, made my 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 year 2024 is a great success now if our if our feet are moving the right in the right pattern right if we're moving towards whether that's forehand backhand right at us on the run whatever if we're moving in the right direction and when our feet are doing the right things our hands just need to go from catch to transfer that's it it doesn't there doesn't need to be a an extra move that's an extra step that can throw the body out of sync there's a bunch of that so so getting off tangent there but what, what wash is doing is is preaching pocket accuracy like go catch the ball accurately in the pocket it's going to create confidence in your hands but it's also going to give your feet a chance to really get it with you and then you're going to be able to make make a good throw and that's that's kind of the the feel that i got from him but the the other side of it is that it's something to follow every day and it's like it's it, like we said earlier, it's, it's the base, it's the foundation. It's like, I, I know that if that's the only thing that I do that day, I've gotten 97 reps or whatever it is in five minutes. And, you know, I, I can, I can sleep on that. I can, I can hold that, you know, tight and go, go on with the rest of my day, whether I just jump into a game or, or not, but at least I did that foundational work. And I know, again, I'm getting off tangent, but I, I just think there's oh, a lot good. of I think there's a lot of value in 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 having that routine and having that 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 standard. You know, and, um, it's exciting. It's exciting to be around and see it and see the guys that have been with him in the past do it. Like we have a couple of guys on staff that worked or played with the the, the Braves and actually did it. Um, you know, over and over for years, and like it's like second nature to them. It's it's awesome, and they're so clean with their actions. They really are, dude. Like. The, the guy stood up the other day and was talking about his routine and said he's got like 11 platinum gloves and like 33 gold gloves under him with this with this routine. And you're like, you can't you can't deny that that, that doesn't work. So, damn, um, that's yeah. some hardware it's, that I'm not arguing with. It's that's, crazy. That's so amazing, man. And listen, I'm not a abs. I don't coach in absolutes. I think the game is too ever yeah. flow. And, and there's there's it's t everyone's so different. You can't. Right. I've just known that what what my my job's communication. So when I say words, when I say cues, that is that's me communicating to an athlete, and they're gonna demonstrate something back based on what I'm asking of them or cueing. I've just learned that when I say the word funnel, I get actions I don't like. I get actions that the game doesn't like. I get actions that speed the game up for the infielder. Mm -hmm. And and if someone's really efficient with it, I'm not taking it away. Like if someone no, a pro guy no. comes in and he likes it, and that's his transition timing, you got it, my man. We're we're going. Yeah. He comes in and he can't he can't he can't separate ball middle or get throw. Well, he, he he could do that if he's playing pro ball. But you get my point. Uh, before yeah. I go down a tangent, um, I love the ball control. You you know when you hear a good pop from an infielder right on a routine ground ball, and you hear right in the palm. It's crazy how se like good their sequences are on their throw. You know, mm -hmm. it, it's not crazy because it sounds simple, but it's just, it's like from trying to complicate things, catch the ball in your palm when you need to, you'll be a good thrower. Yeah. What's um, one thing, let me, let, let me ask you something. What's one thing that you would tell your athletes that your infielders that it's not, you're not going to catch something cleanly all the time. And there's going to be times where you're going to catch a ball. It might, it might pick up on you, get you in between, whatever. What What's something that you could tell, your guys to resync their body to make a good throw and not let that hop or something to, you know, get them offline and make a, make an errant throw. Cause I see a lot of guys, especially younger kids, um, you know, if, a, if a, a ball takes a bad hop, then they get sped up and they rush and they make some air and throw. What, what's something that you would verbalize to your guys? Like, Hey, how do we get back in sync quick? You, you yes, you, you just got a tough hop. How do you get back in sync? I love that. That that's a loaded question. When I hear, that we talk about audibles right like yo our first read is off the first hop and we're gonna attack that and we can't think about bad hops but we need to react to them so like we just kind of put the context like listen quarterback pulls up the line of scrimmage he sees something he he did doesn't like he calls an audible to change based on the strategy of the defense yeah if the game asks you to react and and get a little bit um 
out of sync. I don't know like how like that. I feel like you got to just teach creativity. I feel like you got to put them in uncomfortable positions. But like, yeah. you know, if you have to decelerate a hop by funneling, do it with one hand yeah. or two hands, do it. But ultimately know that I think like what's going to help you the most there is probably your feet. Like your feet have to get you back in line or get yeah. reactivated to have some kind of chance to throw. Um yeah. I also think create like athletic throwing helps you out there, right? Like when, when you get bad hops that disrupt your rhythm, like we now become the athlete, I think. So that's why we work a lot of like, like, like I have balls coming in way different directions and they have to track it from forward sideways in air in the, in flight on the ground. And they got to get right. creative releasing balls from different shelves. So it's, it's, I don't, I don't know. It's contextual to where the ball is, but does that make sense? Like if I could teach a kid who's adjustable, adaptable, um, and has slots to throw from, and he trains one and two hand throws from athletic positions, like I think yeah. that wins. For sure. For sure. I I, I don't, I, that's the thing. It's like, I, there is no wrong answer. It's just that I, I'm curious to see how someone like, like you would, would kind of talk about it. It's funny that you go to like the throw. For me, I think you're, I think you're absolutely right. Like obviously you need to be athletic and creative and be able to throw from all different spots. And that that's huge. And you it should be done in catch play, which I'm, I've seen you do with your guys. Like it's awesome. It's great. Um, for me, I think what gets missed and, and, and you see it at the major league level, I, you watch it a bunch of times. I don't even think they know they're doing it, but I think it's something that needs to be taught. And it's if a ball catches you out of sync, right? Oh shoot! Like you, you might have chopped your feet perfectly, timed everything up, everything's landing nicely, and all of a sudden it takes a little hop on you and it, it wobbles in your glove, right? But you still have time. We understand we have time, right? If we can, if we can understand that ahead of time and know that we're just going to throw the ball to first base, there's no panic. I like to think about and now like to see, and I'm going to start to maybe implement with some guys. It doesn't have to be everybody, but a run step. You caught it. Run to reorganize towards first base. Take three or four hard running steps resync and just throw the ball I, I don't I think it gets missed I, I really do I ultimately you just caught the ball great job so what you caught it. it wasn't perfect but you've got to not dwell on the fact that it wasn't perfect don't rush and try and throw something offline get yourself back in in, in line that's pace and, though right that's you redeveloping pace in a in yeah. a uh various environments so I've seen Bogarts do that a lot right he would go, he would go glove is. side and a ball would yeah. kick up on him and he wanted to go one hand but the ball took a top spin hop where he's in between. He decelerated with one, two hands and yep. his feet never stopped. They kept running at first while his hands yep. were out in front of his hips and yep. then was athletic and threw on the run. Needs to happen. I love that. I love I mean, that. I think it needs, I think it needs to be preached. I think it needs to become a, almost fundamental for guys. Like I, I want that to be worked on. But for me, I, I, it's something that you see them do naturally. I, there's no reason you can't make that. You can't practice the natural movement. Like I, that needs to be like noticed shown to the players and then emphasize like because this well, this stuff is, this stuff's going to happen in a game like you need to understand that this is something to practice and it's it's a great thing to work on and frankly it it's kind of sexy like go do it sick. you know yeah i think it's awesome, it, it, so. or it exposes your inability to throw from different windows um because your head's all over the place when you throw Absolutely. and it takes forever but when I saw that with Bogarts, I started implementing with some of the guys. And you have to bring context to it because, like, why the hell am I going? Why am I forcing two hands here? And, and I'm on turf. So, I, like, I'm like, yo, use your imagination, man. Um, But I freaking yeah. love that. And it's part of, like, yo, drop the ball, pick it up, run, throw. Like, I th like I think that's a way you can implement, like, some, all right, so this is, is wasn't ideal. I didn't plan for this. But here yeah. we are. I still yeah. need to do my job. Yeah, absolutely. I absolutely. That. Yeah, I, I just think there's I, that's one of the things, again, I'm going to go back to to you and, and what you do with your videos is where it's so important to isolate the movement pieces of of feeling a ground ball um, and throwing the baseball like the way you can you can the way you like show just your first step in one direction and how you break down the body and what the body needs to look like if to be able to do that with with young infielders is so crucial and be able to actually show them that move. Um, it's, I think it's invaluable. And I personally love it. I, I nerd out on that stuff. I love watching that stuff. It's like, a, it's, it's hitting coaches watching sequence where they watch, <laughs> uh, he's not getting his lead arm off the body or, or like he's, he's out of, out of sync with his knob, his barrel tilt, whatever it might be. I don't know. I'm not going to talk hitting, but 
those are the same things. We need to do that on the defensive side. You need to nitpick at times. You need to break down little things. And, and sometimes, especially with pro guys, dude, it's like, man, you're getting flat footed with your left foot like way too early. It's 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 rippling back up your body. And you're, you're getting all your weight in your back foot or whatever it might be. That stuff needs to be looked at. It's some and and sometimes it's as simple as just like, bro, let that left foot hover a little longer, or like chop your feet a little earlier, or you know your your strides are way too long out of your out of your pre pitch, whatever it might be. It, it's sometimes the smallest little thing that can just make things click. And all of a sudden they're like they're confident. They're going on a, on a streak of no errors for three months. Like it's wild. And so a, a good a good infield coach or a good coach in general, hitting pitching doesn't matter. Can can isolate like one little little movement piece and, and make it click for an athlete, right? Um, and then if it's I, not the piece, they can transition off of that. Maybe find another piece. That's your that's our job. But but dude, I, I, I that's love why that. I love what you do, and I think that's why you know you've gained the reputation that you have is because you are able to isolate and really pick out the details. And I I think it's invaluable. I, I, I your, your Instagram account is a true like that. It's it's the follow for me right now. Like it's it. it it's, it's, it's my learning. That's where I learn. I honestly, truly learn so much from you. It's, it's, it's really cool. Like genuinely. That means a lot, my man. I, re I really appreciate it. I love what I do. I'm passionate about it. And I hope I put some things out there where people can learn from it because that's what's in my head. Um, and it's stuff that I, I use and I appreciate you, my man. It means a lot coming from you before. Yeah. Uh, listen, I want to be re uh, respectful of your time. So you let me know you we're literally good. we're okay. Just a kind of ripping right. back. I think it's links, right? It's like links. You have this infielder who has to do this job and in 50 different ways and it can't be black and white. That's why it's like you, you figure out links to connect the dots for these infielders to learn on their own, but to have the necessary tools. So my job coaching these youth infielders is to give them as many tools as possible, but also the overarching context to when to use what, and also the mm -hmm. enough confidence to know that, you know, that's not it for that play doesn't mean you never use that tool again. It's just that that's not, that was an improper use of it. So it's yeah. like, that's our job as coach, especially like at the youth level. I, um, you, you're working with guys who have pretty damn good tools, but what else on that coach is another thing. I just, I love your, you said seven different ways to fix the same thing. You know, like I love to chop your feet. Like instead of if your eyes are indecisive about a shape or speed, don't let those guys stop. They're your only chance to get to where you need to go, like chance to freedom to get through the door. Chop Absolutely. them up and go. Um, yeah. If you're talking like, and I, I don't even know how much time you want here, but dude, I can keep going. But if it, the other thing too is like, if we talk about seven different ways to fix something, like a lot of things that get missed too is sometimes everybody, you know, will we'll look at, all right, they're actually physically feeling the ground ball and like what's going, what's going wrong. It just does, it looks out of sync. Sometimes it's as much as like, before they've even moved where where are they setting up before the ball's even getting through the hitting zone you know if it's a, if it's a fungal being hit on them are they too are they too high and so their first move is like eyes down and then move or like can can we keep them up there and let them move from there like a lot of it you got to go right back to like the beginning and like look at it from the very second that ball's about to be hit you know and then, that. And, and then break because too many guys look at well he, he caught it and he's all out of sync well why where did that where does that start and we got to be able to pull back. You got to peel back the layers and go right back to the base. If you can't do that. that, you're not going to be able to help that infielder, in my opinion. So that's that for me. It's like you can do drills to the cows come home, but you, you also got to be able to prescribe the right the right drill, right? And sometimes it's not it's not a drill. It's 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 as much as just being like, dude, you're just too high. Like you're just starting too high. You get sink just start a little bit more neutral or get real low and maybe make it like it's, it's different for everybody, but it's not always about like people are so quick to be like drills, 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 drills. Oh, it's like, <laughs> it, it, it stresses me out. There's purpose for them. Don't get me wrong, but dude, sometimes it's a conversation and just like making them feel something and you don't need a drill to make them feel something. You know what I mean? So heck yeah. I think it, yo, the, you have to figure out who's in front of you and communicate clearly and, at the end of the day, like constraints are amazing. I use constraint drills all the time sure. to bring awareness to these kids for 80 different skills. But you also have to know, like, again, the goal is to catch the ball and throw it first. You have to be able to do that. Yeah. Um, yeah. So sometimes you need them to just go do that and fail and be like, oh, you ready? You ready to come over here? <laughs> no doubt. You ready to work on your pre pit setup, man? Because this ain't working. No, no um, doubt. What I, I like, I love that. And we always layer it back to where it all starts, the origin. I think a lot of good happens there. A lot of bad happens there. But um, 
it's something cool like levels and one thing that like at the youth level glove presentation is just very difficult i think it's really because of the the lack of strength and body awareness and stuff like that or just i think it's mostly that because they all get like two seven fingertips down like yo the thing i'm hot on right now coach is like the lowest hanging fruit, if you look at Lindor on a two-handed lane, his right wrist is never not open. Like, he opens up his wrist hinges so beautifully. Like, if I was catching this microphone, he's always there, and it's beautiful. And he's got yeah. so much space, surface area to get in there, grab his good four-seam grip, and collect his out. So many youth kids, whatever, they're late, slash. But if they do do a good job with their glove side presentation, awesome, just to do this. It looks like the scary movie, <laughs> my germs, my germs. I'm like, yo, bro, <laughs> open up your wrist hinges. There's great stuff in there. What do you got on glove presentation? I, to be honest, I never even thought about wrist hinges. So I just learned that right there. You're, you're looking at something that Lindor does with his top, with his throwing yes. hands. That's, I had actually just had a kid from back in, back home ask me about what his throwing hand should be doing when he feels the ground ball. I'm like, Bro, it's different for everybody. It really is. However, now just listening to you just talk about that and emphasize just that move, that's actually that's that's awesome. I love that. I, I, I could get awesome. in there. I could con- I sure. could kill the ball there now. You know what I for mean? Sure. For sure. No, that's great. And that I think that's one thing that Wash preaches too with the two hand move. Like he's like, get your hand on it. Get your hand on it. And so, how do you get your hand on it? I think that's that's an amazing thing to point out. And again, finer detail. They're, you're looking at it again, a movement of a little tiny piece of your body that can make such a massive massive uh you know deal right massive influence i think for me with glove presentation i think that uh, i don't that the term is the term like glove presentation we got to show our glove sure whatever and there's so many different ways to try and like verbalize it to kids with like there's an eye in the middle of your palm like tr- never never let that eye i always has to stay on the ball whatever whatever you want to say to the guys for me it's like it's timing of it all and then and then you know understanding where that glove needs to be to like you can still stay in sync with your body if you're if you're sticking your glove out way too early your body's not going to work too well behind it um if it's if it's late you know you might you might get hard hands and you might clank something so for me it's like timing um timing of it and then where you're starting with it so for me it's like i'm i'm big like I'm, you've I've, you've heard it before like the gun holsters right mm-hmm. um you have your, your hands down by your sides and like you, you're, you're just you're just athletic ready to move um and you everything's just shooting from the hip but it's like a it's like a you're landing a plane kai Correa said it best it, it, yeah you're, you're literally landing a plane and that glove is just the landing gear going down with you um so i don't know i'm never gonna tell a guy like obviously if there's a big move there's just big like pronounced like flip of a glove i'm gonna try and be like that's that's not it man but i'm also not gonna take away rhythm in, in people's hands either like i don't i don't want to be too stringent on the fact like you can't you should never move your glove at all like no I, I think there needs to be a little bit of like looseness in those hands i think for now honestly i'm gonna i'm gonna use that wrist hinge thing for sure um i think getting just as long as we can get to that point the timing is if the timing of that is is going to be the thing for me to focus on and so every guy's timing is going to be different of when they get to that spot and so looking at how the guy moves and how he lands towards where that ball he's feeling is um is gonna is gonna tell me what i need to work on with that player um but i i think getting to this like you just said is 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 huge um but i also want to keep emphasis on the fact that playing with one hand is huge too man like you don't always need to feel the ball with two hands obviously right so, so i sometimes it's just as good to like instead of maybe just let this go and just go pick that and then pick and yeah, then yep. it. that's fine too so i never want to lock a guy up i never want to take away any fluidity but I also don't want it to be too fluid because that's going to get catch them out of sync. Um, and I don't want them to be too rigid because that just is going to slow them right down as well. So there's great. no it's all perfect based on answer. Play. Yeah, exactly. It's all but based I, on the player, man. How are we going to help that player? Good coaches are able to be like, listen, there's no black and white here, but here's a few Never. scenarios where, or check marks I'm looking at. And everything's action reaction, right? Like if I go out cyclical, I'm going to come yeah. back cyclical. If I'm here slash, I'm going to come back here. So you got to like, that's also something that we keep in mind. And then the glove side wrist, it's, it's, it's not so prevalent at the older ages because it's stronger, like I said earlier. But like if that wrist comes in and it's laxed, right? It's almost like when you see a young, young, young hitter and they hit the ball at contact and the bat like frays back. It's kind of what happens when the ball hits that uh, a lazy or a loose wrist. 
you kind of see that like almost like that recoil of the glove. And it just if the, if the glove's moving, the ball is moving, things aren't going to be good on your transfer. Love yeah. one hands. One hands are amazing. Again, that's a shrinking fields component. The only time I think a coach has to be careful is like, yo, don't don't let kids force one hand and two hand lanes. Like it's just slower transfer. Their their hands and feet get tangled up. Like don't yeah. force that if they don't need to, because ultimately you're using one hand for more glove extension and range. Why did I take a two handed angle to present one hand? If yeah. I'm going to use one hand, I could be more aggressive. I might be able to cut that ball off a little five, six steps earlier because the yeah. ball's off my side of my hip anyway. So that's yeah. why I like, I'm like, yo, don't force things that like, don't force a, squ- a round peg into a square hole. No, Thank you, uh, no. my college coach, for that. But um, no, it's listen, true. It's true. Well, let's wrap this up. You're in downtown LA. You got to get out there. I see number blue skies down here in San Diego. <laughs> coach Travis, this is this is exactly what I thought it was going to be. Two infield geeks just talking about their passion. <laughs> um, I, we could probably have four more of these. Uh, this has been amazing, man. Thank you so much for, for your time and expertise. And thank I'm going to continue to follow you. And thank you for all you do in, um, in this industry. And now I know you're having a major impact up in the pro level before you leave. Right. Like I know you're not as active with content anymore, but like if someone's like, I'm sure a lot of people are going to be like, yo, this is, that guy's a stud. How can they reach you if they have a question or something like that? Yeah, no, for sure. I, first of all, I appreciate you. I love that you're you're creating this this podcast. This is this is needed, man. It's it really is, especially for the younger level, younger guys, man, that are coming up and maybe are starting to get that passion as well. So thank you for doing that. Of course. Um, you know, this has been awesome. I genuinely appreciate you having me on here. Um, for me, it's like it, it, I, I'm not going to be posting as much. It's just like more of a more of just like a, this is my journal now. It's kind sure. of transitioned into that, right? This is my baseball journey. I just like sharing that stuff from kind of for me to look back on and be just watch my own little progression. Um, but if it comes to anything, if anybody needs anything, by all means, I'm very, very accessible. So they just, they just reach out to me on my Instagram. That's perfect. Like just message me videos, whatever, whatever you need. I'm happy to help anybody if they need anything. So um, yeah, reach me on Instagram. And I'm, I'm always accessible. What would you say, Coach, maybe to a, a younger Trevor Knight or a kid who's just getting done in high school or college? What are some – looking back, do you have any, any advice for him? Yeah. Um, my thing is you, there's so many amazing, you know, travel ball programs now that all have their certain certain booklets of, of philosophies and cultures. And, um, you know, there's good programs and there's, and there's not so good programs. But I think what – the youngest, the younger amateur guys need to understand is that the second that you're a part of something like a team and there's a, there's a standard that that team wants, it's, you might not agree with every single thing that, 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 that standard says, but it's about following protocol. And ultimately like, you don't know where your journey is going to be. It's great to have a goal of, of being a major league baseball player, but you also need to understand at a young age that you're training not to just be a baseball player, but you're training to be a, a, a good man. Like you need to be a good man. And if being on a team, it's like the most invalid, it's, it's the best way to just become, to learn how to follow protocol and to respect your teammates, to respect your coworkers. Eventually you also don't know what Avenue you're going to go. And so if you as a younger athlete are slacking in any department, whether it's like I'm giving my all when it comes to baseball training but then i get to school and i don't have the same work work ethic well then you you're you're just that's just it's just pointless you need to understand like it's an all-encompassing thing and like if you can if you can have good habits you know in the cage on the field you need to carry those habits into your home life you know with your family with your parents listening to your parents and then when you get to school same thing man like good habits you don't have to be the smartest guy you don't have to be you don't have to go to, to Yale. You don't you don't even have to go to college if you don't want. But you need to understand how to follow protocol, how to be a good, good person in society. And that's what baseball and being a part of a good group is and, do, and, and does for you. Like it, it builds good habits, develops good humans um, and uh, essentially allows you to explore options once you are done uh, playing. And, you know, some guys might make it to the big times and some guys might not. But there's also the, the the route of coaching, man. I stopped playing when I was 24. I wish I wish I played in the big leagues. That would have been awesome. But I wasn't that good. That was the truth. And so, I, the coaching thing was there for me, and I I dove into that, and it's it's opened up this world of, it's unbelievable what's what's out there. And so, 
biggest advice is, man, is just, is just don't, don't slack in any department. Just don't slack in any department. Be open to open to adjustments and 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 stay positive and, and continue to just grow and don't close your doors too early. Just stay open. There's tons of different routes to go. And if you want to stay in this game, there's tons of different things to do in it. So um reach out if they need anything by all means. But um I'm always I'm always accessible and I love hearing from people. So uh, man, if this has been this has been awesome. So I appreciate it. Coach Trevor Knight, you're the man. And that, that that was an awesome closing to that. I think that's just such a great message for the youth to hear. Um, best, best of luck this uh, spring training and spring and summer. And look forward to having you back on for season three. You too, man. Appreciate it, man. Thank you, dude. You, you're the man.